Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. For he sought me and he bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. <laughs> What'd you think of that introduction? How many of you are feeling victory in Jesus? I gotta tell you, I'm not one of them. I am not one of them. I heard that song a couple of weeks ago in church and it came to mind as I was studying this week for the podcast and I realized that, you know what? I really don't feel that victory in Jesus. And I wondered how many of you shared those feelings. In Luke chapter 18, Jesus said that if you do not um, come to him and trust him like a little child, you'll never, never enter the kingdom of heaven. And he meant, of course, by that, that we should trust his father completely. Like a child trusts their parents. When my girls were little, they would come to me with these ridiculous math equations of all these numbers, you know, trillions, quadrillions, billions, trillions, divided by two, multiplied by, by 3.6, divided by who knows what. And then I would look at them and go, hmm, ooh, let me think about that. I go, the answer is, and I would spit out some number, and they were like mesmerized. Oh my gosh, my dad is a math whiz. They go, Dad, can we do it again? I go, sure. And they would do it again. And then I would go, hmm, ooh, that's a tough one. Hmm, I gotta really think about that one. And then I'd spit out some random numbers and they were just blown away. They thought I was a genius, but of course I was just making stuff up. They believed me because I was their father and they trusted me completely. Now, when I was first saved, it was really transformative in my life. I was uh, living in Southern California and I was attending this church that had a college age group that every summer would have a beach party. And we were hanging out at a campfire, and it was a, a church, a, a big church, uh, with a lot of established kids, families, church kids. They grew up in the church. They really had never been outside the church, you know? And then there's me, you know? Hey, the new Christian! I'm in Jesus! Woohoo! I am saved! And I'm looking around the campfire, and there's not a lot of enthusiasm there, but I'm, <laughs> woohoo! I'm excited, and I'm pumped, and, and I've got, I'm like the Energizer Bunny, you know what I mean? And people, I, I remember the kids looking at me and saying, I remember when I felt that way. I go, what do you mean? I'm always going to feel this way. <laughs> I'm born again. Why don't you feel this way? And they go, yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll learn. And, and of course, I had no idea what they were talking about. Now I know what they're talking about. I lost that innocence, that naivete, when my wife walked out on me. And I lost my pulpit. And that was over 20 years ago, and I've never been the same. Can you relate to that? Has it, is that experience similar to yours, that you were on fire, enthusiastic, and then something happened, maybe a lot of things happened, maybe terrible, painful things happened, and you said, you know what? I'm not gonna trust that God anymore, not completely. I'm gonna hold on to a couple things, I'm just not gonna entrust to him, you know what I mean? Maybe it was a divorce for you. Maybe you lost a job in your home. Maybe you just can't find a job. Maybe you had a child die. Maybe your spouse has a chronic illness that they'll never recover from. Maybe you have terrible parents. Maybe you have no parents. Maybe you've been sexually abused. Maybe you've been lied about in your church, backstabbed by people you trusted. They've let you down. But has something happened that's killed your enthusiasm? I realized, for me, that I was embittered with God for taking something away from me that I'd always seen as a gift from Him. This, the pulpit ministry that I had was something I cherished. I never took it for granted. I never took it lightly. I always treated it very seriously. And I always saw it as a gift from God. And at one point, God took it away from me. And I got really angry about it. Now, where in the scripture am I promised a pulpit? 
Where in the scripture am I promised a faithful wife? Where in the scripture are any of us promised any of the things that we're mad at God for taking away from us? You see, my friends, I, speaking for myself, I underestimated the depth of my own sin, and yet I'm someone who's taught the doctrines of grace and, and taught on the depravity of man and how, 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 how important it is to really grasp that if we're to understand grace. And yet I did not understand it myself, the depth of my own sin. I heard a sermon by Dr. Sinclair Ferguson on Psalm 51, a great penitential psalm of King David. And he, and as part of his sermon, Dr. Ferguson was talking about a quote from St. Augustine who said, Lord, make me holy, make me clean, but not yet, not yet. You see, Augustine, while born again, understood that his love for Christ was imperfect and that because he was still a fallen creature, that he still had a love for the world and the things of the world that if God just ripped from him all at once, it could crush him. Well, when I heard that quote and I heard that sermon, I thought, wow, Augustine is a coward. If you were in my church at that time, you probably remember me talking about that. And I challenged some of you at that time, and I challenged myself, I said, you know what? Augustine was a coward. If he really trusted his God, if he really had confidence in the goodness of his God, he said, Lord, make me holy, make me clean, and do it now, right now. arrogance. Oh gosh, the arrogance. <sighs> In three weeks, I lost my wife in my pulpit. God was faithful to that prayer. I want to be holy. I want to be clean. Then he took away the things that were really more important to me than himself. What I thought was a prayer of humility and trust really was just a demonstration of my arrogance and my lack of of understanding of the depth of my own sin. My friends, God wants you to be like Jesus. To do that requires surgery, and that's called sanctification. The process of transforming us to the image of Christ. And my friends, we do not get how really sinful we are. And so that process of sanctification can be bloody. It can be excruciatingly painful. It can, because what's more important than your temporal happiness to God is your witness for him in this life. And my friends, I would not be here with you today were it not for that experience. I was a legalistic jerk, angry. Uh, I would quarrel with everybody. I mean, I was, if you disagreed with me, then I just didn't think you were a Christian. You know, it was just so, so awful. I was so awful. And then he showed me my sin by taking away the things that I loved the most. So things happen. We lose our confidence in God. We stop trusting God. We stop looking to Him for our sanct for our peace and our joy and our happiness. And what do we do? If we're not going to look for our happiness in God, we're going to look for it somewhere else. Yeah. John Calvin said that each one of us is a master craftsman of idols. That each one of us is capable of worshiping just about anything at all but God. That when we are pressed, and frustrated and despairing. We'll look anywhere but God for our answers and we will bow down to that idol, whether that idol is porn, whether that idol is food, whether that idol is work, whether that idol is sports, whether that idol is friends, whether that idol is whatever it is other than himself. We'll do that because we won't trust our God. Is this resonating with any of you out there? What is the issue? In Philippians chapter 4, Paul said that he had learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Now, you know what that man went through, right? You ever read 2 Corinthians chapter 11? Remember in the book of Acts, Paul is promised that he's going to suffer a lot for the sake of Christ. Paul suffered an awful lot. Beatings, torture, imprisonment, shipwreck, all kinds of terrible things. But what was his conclusion? What was his conclusion in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Right? I delight in beatings. I delight in hardships. For when I am weak, then I am strong. 
Do you delight in hardships? I don't. Do, I de do you delight in persecutions? I don't. They, it hurts. I get frustrated. I get discouraged. I despair. And yet, and yet, we talk about the faithfulness of God a couple of weeks ago. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. So why do we get so upset when we have trouble? Think about it. If you are really faithful, okay, and you are meek, you are humble, you hunger and thirst for righteousness, what is the final beatitude? After all that faithfulness and all that obedience, if, if you're truly a powerful witness for Christ, you will be persecuted for your faith. And how do we respond when we are? We get embittered. We get angry. We get frustrated. We shake our fist at God. Hey, I'm doing all this stuff for you. Look what's happening. Exactly what he said would happen. So what is the secret? What is the secret that Paul learned to be content in any Every situation, John Calvin in his commentary on Philippians chapter 4, he says that Paul came to understand that no matter what his circumstances, no matter what happened to him, that God was good. In Larry Crabb's book, Finding God, he's a Christian psychologist and a prolific author. He says if there is one thing that could radically transform the lives of his patients, that maybe a silver bullet, if you will. If there's one thing that Christians could believe, I mean really believe, that could change their lives forever, is that God is good, unalterably good, immutably good, infinitely good in everything. In my divorce, God was good. Losing the pulpit, God is good. The death of a child, Hunger, persecution, God is good, God is good. Because that's what the Bible declares. The verses are gonna be right down here. We don't judge God based on what we see, do we? What is faith? What does Hebrews tell us faith is? Certain of what we're helped for, certain that we don't see. The scriptures declare God is good, therefore he is. How could Paul say that all things work for the good for those who love God if the giver of those things wasn't himself good? Paul understood, he learned through very, very difficult trials that God was good and completely worthy of his trust. Will you trust that God is good? Will you? Because my friends, until you do, until I do, when things get tough, you're gonna to accuse God. You're gonna turn from him and you're gonna to turn to sin. And that roller coaster will start all over again, my friends. I'm sick of it. And I'm going to tell you something else. I'm tired of being afraid. Ever since my divorce and losing the pulpit, I've been afraid. I was a, God made me keenly aware of my sin, and I understood how painful it could be for my sanctification. Okay, I knew how difficult it could be. And I'm always afraid of what God's going to take away from me next. And I've spent most of the last 20 years living in fear. I've never admitted that to anybody. But I'm afraid a lot. Are you? If I really believed that God was good, I wouldn't be afraid. I wouldn't. Because all things work for the good for those who love God. For those who are called according to his purpose, my God is good. What he does is good. Not because I can't, I, I can't see that always. But the Bible declares it, therefore it is true. Pastor Bob has asked me to put the title pastor on these podcasts. I am actually an ordained sanctuary pastor, but I don't. Because I'm afraid. With that title comes certain expectations and also comes scrutiny and also comes the enemy. And I gotta tell you, last time I had that title, it was very difficult, it was really painful. And I'm afraid of doing it again. And I don't know if I have the courage to do it. I don't know. But I do know that I really want to have that courage again. Whether I, that confidence that I had at first, you know, sitting around that campfire, woo, I don't have to be anxious. I'm anxious. I trust God. I'm so happy. Woohoo! Yeah, I'm not. 
I'm not a lot of the time. I don't know if any of you can relate to this or not. I, I don't know. But I do know that that secret that Paul spoke about is the goodness of God. Think about it. Contemplate it. Look at those verses that I'm going to give you. Please check out my Facebook page. I've got a lot of information on there for you this week that I just couldn't fit into this podcast, okay? Can we trust in the goodness of God? It could really radically transform my life. Yours too. What do you say? Can we trust him? Can we? I think we can. Do we have the courage to do it? I'm going to pray to the Holy Spirit for the courage to do it. And I'm going to pray for you too. Thanks for tuning in. And I'll talk to you next week.